Sure. Uh, we have two cases that we are uh, actively litigating. Um, I'll tell you about one. Um, it it's involves a uh, a bead making company that makes, you know, they make like plastic beads and sell them around the country. Um, we filed a lawsuit in federal court in Louisiana. Um, if you're an out-of-state seller into a state, into another state, you know, there's, lo there's lots of laws you have to comply with, and sales tax is one of them. And in Louisiana, you have to file paperwork in every single parish there, um, parishes in Louisiana. Uh, uh, be, because Louisiana is like the only state that has parishes in instead of counties, right? Yeah, that's they, they call it parishes instead of counties. But yeah, that's, um, but yeah. In every single parish, you have to do, every single parish you sell into, you have to do paperwork to that parish. And It's a very tough system to comply with, and it definitely creates a burden on, on interstate commerce. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting who collects the taxes. In some parishes, it's the sheriff that does the tax collection for uh, for sales tax. So, you know, uh, I like to say it's sort of a, a, a New Orleans version of 1600s Nottingham, as far as that goes. <laughs> Esto es. Esto es. Esto es. La inquietud con Garrett Edwards. El lugar donde hay más preguntas que certezas. Damos vuelta de página aquí en La Inquietud por CNN Radio Rosario. Tenemos un enorme honor, placer y privilegio. Es vicepresidente de Asociaciones Estratégicas de la National Taxpayers Union, la Unión Nacional de Contribuyentes, la NTU en los Estados Unidos de América. Antes de eso tuvo puestos senior de desarrollo en Atlas Network y en el Competitive Enterprise Institute, CEI, el Instituto de Competitividad empresarial, es nativo del área de la Bahía de San Francisco, es economista graduado de la Universidad de California en San Diego y vive en Washington D.C. en los Estados Unidos de América, es también un amigo, es Al Canada Al, how are you doing? Now we are speaking in English, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us at La Inquietud, Garrett Edwards here on the other side Hey Garrett, good uh, good to see you. And I've, I've been practicing Spanish on Duolingo, so I think I actually understood a few things that you even said in Spanish. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I said all good and nice things. Uh, I, I guess you caught most of them. Uh, as I was saying, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us. You're also a friend. Uh, I'd like to start with a topic, with a hot topic in, in the US right now. Uh, one that we're probably pretty used to here in Argentina, which has to do with the economy and has to do with inflation. Uh, how are you, are you analyzing the current economic situation in the U.S., in particular regarding to inflation? Well, you know, as you pointed out, right, Americans are probably feeling this um, where you Argentinians have, you know, felt this on a daily basis. And for us, it's been 40 years. Um, but, I mean, every report, right, 8% uh, price increases year over year. Uh, and on a variety of goods, some it's using as high as 20 and 30% increases on, on some goods and services. So, it, I mean, it's, it's real, it's here, it's in American spaces. Um, and there's probably not a single place that you haven't felt in some fashion, right? They, there's a little joke in the U.S., you know, called shrinkflation. You know, it's when you, you go to a restaurant and the price hasn't changed. But, you know, instead of a, a half pound burger, maybe it's a quarter pound burger or something, you know, something along those lines. So everyone's seeing it. Um, And I think, you know, this is probably the consequence of loose money for a few years and, and a lot of deficit spending. And, uh, you know, it all, the perfect storm seems to have, have finally taken hold. Uh, as you were saying, Al, uh, there's a, a perfect storm brewing in the U.S. when it comes to the inflation and the economy. How do you think the international context is playing along those lines? You mean, how is it affecting, like, yeah. trade with other countries, you mean? Exactly. Um, You know, I think to some extent, some of the trade issues are contributing to it. Uh, you know, there's still tariffs on, there's still, as far as I know, tariffs on Canadian lumber. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of container ships sitting off the ports of Shanghai and, you know, Long Beach just a couple months ago. They, well, I, I guess there's still lots of container ships backed up, but they're, you know, a few miles off. They're not quite off the coast now. Um, but all that has a real impact um, on prices. I mean, probably one of the most legendary things here is the, the shortage of, you know, my, of chips for, you know, well, Cars was probably the most famous example in your face, but you know there's there's not a single device you buy these days that it isn't at least somewhat smart, right? And that's having an impact, you know, throughout the board. And there's you know, and like probably maybe the most famous story of the day is a shortage of baby formula. So I mean, it's it, 
it's everywhere. And this, to the point, the international context trade is, is contributing to it as well. Um, we have recently gotten people to start understanding here in Argentina what do tax what, what, what do poli, what, what do politicians do with the, their taxes and how everything works around that? It's called the National Taxpayers Union. What does it do? NTU has been around for 53 years. Our goal has always been to be, let's say, the, the taxpayers lobbyist in DC. And we are trying to push policies that are, broadly speaking, lower taxes, less government spending. But, there, but everything we do is trying to move the ball to make taxpayers' life easier when it comes to the tax burdens or economic freedom. And that's coming on a, a few topics, but tax being our core one. Um, and I think we've built a really good reputation here in town as a aggressive, but um, a pragmatic voice on, on issues that affect all Americans. That's really interesting as well, Al, because uh, for example, there's no lobbying law here in Argentina. H how does the lobbying work in the US? Um, it's a pretty open-ended question, but uh, it, it, it takes lots of forms to be sure, right? Lo I mean, there's lobbying used kind of broadly, right? Because some yeah. things we do lobbying, some things we do is educating lawmakers. Um, in our case, you know, we are just, we are trying to provide what we think is objectively good information for lawmakers. And we'll meet with the lawmaker at the federal state level or their staffs um, to make the case, whether it's say, preserving the best parts of the 2017 tax reform that happened here in the United States. Um, you know, some of those some of those provisions start to expire this year and we are working to keep the, keep those good ones, keep the good ones in place, um, whether it's around expensing or some other items. Uh, but if that doesn't work, you know, in, we also have a litigation effort that we've just started and it's our public interest um, litigation for tax issues called our taxpayer defense center. And the idea here is that we want to score um, wins in court for taxpayers. Uh, you know, this has not been done before. There's lots of other public interest law issues. I know you're familiar with them from what you do, but no one's done it on tax, particularly from a, a, a limited government angle. And you know, our goal is, can we get courts to recognize the rights of taxpayers when they have a tax dispute? And that's, that's what we're doing. I'm going to follow on that thread, uh, Al, because it sounds really promising. So uh, this is fairly recent, the Taxpayers Defense Center at NTU. Are you currently right now litigating cases? Uh, is there something you could share with us uh, publicly? Sure. Uh, we have two cases that we are uh, actively litigating. Um, I'll tell you about one. Um, it it's involves a, uh, a bead making company that makes, you know, they make like plastic beads and sell them around the country. Um, we filed a lawsuit in federal court in Louisiana. Um, if you're an out-of-state seller into a state, into another state, you know, there's, lo there's lots of laws you have to comply with, and sales tax is one of them. And in Louisiana, you have to file paperwork in every single parish there, um, parishes in Louisiana. Uh, uh, be because Louisiana is like the only state that has parishes in instead of counties, right? Yeah, that's they, they call it parishes instead of counties, but yeah, that's, um, but yeah. In every single parish, you have to do Every single parish you sell into, you have to do paperwork to that parish. And it's a very tough system to comply with. And it definitely creates a burden on, on interstate commerce. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting who collects the taxes. In some parishes, it's the sheriff that does the tax collection for uh, for sales tax. So, I, you know, uh, let's say it's sort of a, a, a New Orleans version of 1600s Nottingham, as far as that goes. <laughs> But, um, uh, But that's the case we're litigating. It's small business just trying to sell to people who want to to buy, you know, I mean, relatively, you know, you know, these aren't big ticket items, right? You know, not like buying like, you know, a $200,000, you know, truck or something like that. It's, you know, it's people buying beads and, you know, it's lots of small businesses get locked out of being able to sell in the States because and into Louisiana because it's just too hard to comply with that tax system there.
I, I, I'm just really looking forward to seeing that advancing. I'll, uh, I know that timelines, are, especially the legal ones, are not set in, in stone. Uh, that will probably take years in Argentina to get a, 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 a ruling. Uh, is it that long in the US for these kind of cases? Is it years or, or what kind of uh, prediction or expectation do you have at NTU with these cases? I don't like to make an expectation on these things. I've seen these kind of cases move to complete to completion in 18 months. And I've seen some that can take five and six years. It, I think it just depends on how urgent is it by a court? You know, what's the judge's urgency on it? It's, State it's procedures, a, uh, federal ones in this case. And yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, like everywhere else, COVID the last couple of years has made certain things, timelines involving the courts harder, right? So it's, you know, it's... In my mind, it's not predictable. My, my colleagues probably will feel differently, but um, in my mind, it's probably not predictable. Al, you're a great expert on an issue that Argentina used to know and practice a lot about, but uh, it stopped doing probably sometime around the 20th century, and it's still not as big as it used to be and not as big as it could be. It, it has to do with philanthropy. How's the philanthropic culture in the U.S.? Um. <laughs> The U.S. is probably the world's biggest outlier when it comes to philanthropy. Um, you know, it's the, the typical number. It's like 2% of GDP is what the U.S. typically gives away every year. Um, and the last time I looked at the, the comparative numbers, that was, you know, roughly the GDP of Belgium. So, you know, that's given that's given away every year. It's a lot of money. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, some of the parts of the English sphere are somewhat comparably generous. But really, it's I mean, this is very much an American um, in my mind, American, I mean, American phenomenon, how much people give out of their own pockets, or, you know, around and, and the fact that it is kind of a, I don't want to say an industry, um, but it's, it is definitely a viable business model for say an NTU, right? We're, we're donation driven. Um, my last two employers, you know, both of which you mentioned in the intro are completely donation driven. You know, we've never taken a dime of government money and we never will. Um, but it's, it's a unique part of U.S. culture, and it's you know it's it's, it's a very ingrained. Thing to watch. It's ingrained. It's ingrained, and people you know I, I was talking to them the other day and said like, well, people give for the tax breaks, and the answer is actually no. Um, in the twenty years I've done this, I've never had. I think I've twice where a major donor has changed some of their giving behavior because of tax laws. I mean, donors who give to this, um, particular thing around major larger donors. That's something they're passionate about. They, they want to see a group like NTU or an Atlas Network or a CEI or, you know, in your case, you know, uh, Fundation Libertad down in Argentina want to see it succeed. That, that, that's really interesting. What, what, why do you think that, that evolved that way in the U.S.? I mean, it, it, it's entirely cultural. It's not economical, as you said. It's not an e e economic analysis that they do for a taxes or a finance one. It, it has to do with how the U.S. has evolved since its inception, right? Yeah, um, there's there's lots of people who've written about this who are far smarter than I am about it. Um, uh, I, I can think of a couple of examples. Um, you know, one uh, Americans are kind of known for making their little you know groups of, of things, right? And it's you know sometimes it's fraternal orders. It might be a mutual benefit society. It might be you know whether it's a an old Italian sort of civic club or like an NAACP or, you know, there, there's all sorts of them. Americans are known for doing this. And those are largely just, you know, people chipping in and, and giving. And so I think a lot of it really blossoms out of that. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of money that comes out of, out of governments to charities, you know, particularly around sort of things around social services and the like. Um, but, you know, we don't quite have the same welfare state that other places have. And I think that also contributes to just a general feeling of, of charitable giving. Um, and there are probably some things in tax laws here that make certain things easier. Um, but I think some of those cultural elements you mentioned, that you mentioned a lot of this is just cultural. It's like, we, this is just, you know, what we do here. You have been helping, I'll help uh, push the ideas on liberty, not only in the U.S., but all across the globe. Uh, how are you seeing the current landscape on the ideas on liberty right now? Um, you know, I, it's, I think it's a thriving scene as far as I can see. Um, you know, I, National Taxpayers Union, for example, is part of a group called the World Taxpayers Association. And we are working with other free market groups around the globe to push good tax policy. 
Um, so I, I think there's a, a thriving and growing scene, um, which makes me happy. Uh, you know, I've seen some of my friends, um, some of our mutual friends who, you know, five years ago, five, six years ago, were just kind of getting their feet wet and have grown into really wonderful um, institutions promoting the ideas of, of liberty and, you know, free markets and self-determination. It's a wonderful thing to watch. We have been discussing about the, the economy, about inflation, about philanthropy. We have been discussing also about taxes a lot. I mean, it's a national taxpayers uh, union. How, uh, the U.S. has, has, has midterm elections this year. Uh, do you think that taxes and the economy are going to be the biggest or one of the biggest issues uh, in discussion when it comes uh, to that time of the year? Absolutely. I think inflation has been the biggest issue that, that's on voters' minds. You know, they see it, they feel it. Um, from at least the polling I've seen. Uh, yeah, there's there's always concerns about taxes among Americans. It's, you know, it's, it's something, maybe it's another part that's particularly unique to the United States, how much we obsess about tax rates. But, um, but it's certainly, I think it's at the top of people's minds right now. Um, and, you know, after two years of COVID and, you know, I think every, everyone's had it rough, right, in that perspective. But it seems to be at the top of voters' minds and it, it usually is, right? It's the old saying, the, it's the economy stupid sort of thing. And I think that's that's going to be, you know, front and center for lots of voters. I love all those little references uh, all that you, you just peppered. So you Americans are worried about taxes all the time. It's like in the movies when it comes to, to that time of the year when you have to present your uh, tax uh, papers and all of that. People are just worried about that when, when that the, the day comes in the, on the calendar, right? Um, you know, I don't, I think some people are worried about how to deal with it, right? I mean, the IRS, you know, is, you know, I think it's probably the poster child for, you know, tax collection, right? And they're a big agency. And I think people tend to worry they're going to upset the IRS by doing something, um, you know, by whatever might be in their taxes. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, April 15th, uh, you know, I can't speak to other countries well, um, but, you know, April 15th is, you know, stay for us. We have that on, on the last day of December, so. <laughs> well, that's, that doesn't make for a good New Year's party now, does it? Um, it, it doesn't. You know, and, you know, it's, it's, I, it's also been a kind of a tough couple of filing seasons, right? I mean, you know, the IRS was partly closed for a while and it's taken them a little while to catch up with the taxpayers and, I, you know, taxpayers, I think, are feeling it and probably made for an extra frustrating um filing season you are a californian al we're getting on the personal side of things what do you miss the most uh, about california when you're not there oh weather particularly right between say like december and, and february right you know being in north cal or southern california is certainly better uh you know i i though i have grown like to dc for the last gosh it's been almost tech it'll be almost it's almost two decades that i've lived here and i I've definitely adjusted. I, you know, I like the, I, I like what happens here, just a little more to sort of my day-to-day -day, uh, um, affinities, I guess. But when I go back home, what do I miss? You know, like, so the weather, family's there. Um, usually I miss my brother sometimes. We don't miss each other though. You know, it's, it's typical sibling rivalry. Uh, you know, I, but yeah, I'll say, right. Some, some of the innovation stuff that goes on there is, is really fascinating. You're starting to see in lots of other parts of the country, but um, uh You know, like I like to joke, right? A few years ago, you know, we had some driverless cars in our in my parents' neighborhood, right? So it's kind of fun to see like the little, you know, driverless cars go around the neighborhood. It's kind of, it was fun to see. So yeah, that's something that I, I, I don't know if I miss it, but it's definitely something that I I, I notice when I go home. You know, I've never been to the West Coast. What's the play? What's the first place I had to go there when I visit? Lots of places on the West Coast to to visit. I mean. I, tell you what you should go and do when you go there but uh let's we'll save that for another discussion i think <laughs> we'll we'll do uh there's one thing that we we almost never discuss but i know you speak farsi perfectly al do you want to share a little bit on on that front uh i don't know perfectly i can i can get around i would i definitely not call it perfect uh, I, mean, I, I, i i mean i don't speak it but from i i've heard you and you sounded perfect to me Okay. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You know, it's my wife's from Iran. Um, my mother-in-law has lived with us for, you know, most of the 18 years my wife and I have been together. Um, 
So, you know, I mean, my joke is, you know, I, I didn't want them to have, be able to have any secrets from me as far as things go. So that was, you know, one of the reasons why, um, but, you know, I, I you know, went to classes for a while and, you know, did a little, you know, um, self-paced studying and got to, I think it just a comfortable point for me. I, I also enjoyed that, that little tidbit, Al, because my parents used to speak English when I was really little, so I wouldn't understand them. So I, I ended up learning English. So they stopped speaking English. Uh, so I wouldn't understand them. Uh, the last question, Al, uh, we ask out of every, out of every interview here on, on our show, because it's called La Inquietud in Spanish. It's a pan in Spanish. In English, it's kind of lost in the translation, but we have a version that we use when we conduct the interviews in a different language. What makes Al Canada restless? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm the king of overthinking everything. So, I mean, I, I can make myself restless just overthinking something. Um, what keeps me restless? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure this is reckless, but keep, or restless, but keeps me going, right? You know, I've got 25 coworkers that I, you know, really love and enjoy working with every day. So if there's one thing that always kind of keeps my gears grinding, it's like, well, what, what can I do better the next day? So that way they can have the right resources available to them to, to do their job. Because ultimately my job is, you know, um, finding the right financial resources for our, our teams here to operate. And, you know, if that's something that probably keeps me a little restless at night, that's, you know, um, That may be the thing that keeps them the most restless. Um, maybe that means they need to go find another, like a hobby or something like that. But, um, and that's why I think about a lot. I would like to thank you uh, for your time, for the time you share with our audience. We had a, a great time with you and we send you a big hug from Argentina. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Lo teníamos a Al Canata desde los Estados Unidos de América aquí en La Inquietud por CNN Radio Rosario. Esto fue La Inquietud con Garrett Edwards. Síguenos en redes sociales y en www.edwards.com.ar.